Okay, so um, good evening, everybody. Um, uh, for people that don't know me, uh, I'm Michael Poyer. I recently started as chair of the uh, physics department here at OSU. And first, um, for the entire department, I'd like to everyone to welcome everyone to the 58th uh, Alpheus W. Smith lecture, um, which is going to be given by um, James, Professor James Gates, who uh, joins us from Brown University. Um, and he'll be discussing how thinking like a geneticist um, helped him solve a 25 year old Einstein type problem in string theory. I was delighted as a biophysicist, I was delighted that he worked geneticist into his title. Um, so, um, you know, I wanted to first just, um, you know, thank him for taking the time to uh, be with us today. Um, I, I, of course, this is a bit of an unprecedented time. Um, this is the first time um, we're going to be doing this uh, lecture in a virtual format. So I just wanted to first go over, um, you know, because of this format, um, the way people will be able to ask questions is going to be through posting them in the Q&A feature on Zoom. So um, we'll go over those questions at the end. And in addition, um, Terry uh, Bradley, who's done a wonderful job um, organizing all of this, the IT side, um, it's set up where you can um, um, also vote for questions. And so that could help us in determining what might be the best questions to pass on to Professor Gates first. Um, and I also thought it would be worth, worth pointing out, you know, these things where we have to do things differently because of the COVID pandemic. Um, you know, while we can't be together in person, I think at least this format makes it more accessible for people, you know, who can join us throughout the country and even the world. And so, um, you know, it's really a delight I mean, to see the large number of people that are here, and it's it's very similar to to the to previous years. Um, and so, welcome everyone. Um, so, I, I thought I would next would like to just um, talk briefly about um, the lecture itself, you know, which is intended to bring you know highly distinguished scientists here, um, you know, to our community um, to learn about uh, an important uh, scientific topic. Um, the lecture is a tribute to Alpheus W. Smith and is made by made possible by a generosity um, from his family and friends. Um, Alpheus Smith um, had a long distinguished career here at OSU. He's a, he was a native of West Virginia and graduated from um, West Virginia University and Harvard. He joined the faculty in 1909 um, and his research specialties were galvanometric um, and thermomagnetic effects in uh, metals and alloys. Um, he became chairperson in 1927. He then became the dean of the graduate school in 1938 and then retired in 1964. Apparently when he retired, he continued to work and he actually became the president of the OSU Research Foundation and actually served OSU until 1958 where um, he actually served OSU for over 50 years. Um, and this lecture is in recognition of that service, which began in 1960. Okay, so now I would like to introduce, introduce uh, Professor James Gates, again, who comes from um, Brown University. And I guess I better keep this shorter than my original plan. I'll try to make it the right amount. So, so Professor Gates um, received uh, his bachelor's degree in both physics and math uh, from MIT. He then uh, went on and got his PhD in physics where he um, actually did the first doctoral study um, at MIT on supersymmetry. Um, he then um, did most of his career at, um, he went on to do some, did a postdoc at Caltech and Harvard, but he went on to, and did most of his career at University of Maryland. Um, and most recently about, I believe he said four years ago, he was recruited to Brown University, where he's currently the Brown Theoretical Physics uh, Center Director, Ford Foundation Professor of Physics and Faculty Fellow at uh, the Watson Institute for International Studies and Affairs. Um, I guess one, one of the, th a few things that I just wanna just briefly mention then is, is Professor Gates has an outstanding uh, record in terms of um, scientific uh, publications, but not only has he published over 200 papers, but he's, he's published a number of really interesting books um, on on his field of interest, supersymmetry, that have really reached out to even non-scientists. Um, he's done a, a, a huge amount of service. Um, in fact, he's going to soon be our, you know, he's president-elect of the APS. 
Um, and he's gotten a huge number of awards, which as he pointed out, I probably shouldn't go through because I should stop talking so he can talk. But one of the neatest ones I think is that, um, you know, besides being in the National Academy, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, among other things, he um, was awarded by President Obama at the White House, the National Medal of Honor, um, which is the, really the highest award that you can get here in the US. Um, and so again, um, I'd like to thank you, uh, Jim, for being with us today. It's really been a delight to interact with you and I'm super excited about your talk as everyone else. So I will stop talking and welcome. Well, thank you, Michael. Uh, let me just give you a super A for that introduction because I think you got, got it at the right length. Uh, oftentimes people try to uh, read too much from my biography and it's very tiring for me as well as embarrassing. Um, I have one slight correction to make. It wasn't the Medal of Honor, it's the Medal of Science, uh, because the Medal of Honor is reserved for military service. We have a Medal of Arts for artists, and we have a Medal of Honor for military folks, and a Medal of Science for scientists. So it was the Medal of Science, and I was uh, very, very uh, fortunate to be named the 2000, one of the 2011 recipients of the Medal of Science. And, and as you mentioned, it was in a White House ceremony with President Obama. But as you also know, and I sort of cut you off from the, describing it, I also served on uh, his advisory council on sex, science and technology. So I was quite familiar with him by the time of the ceremony. So I need to thank some people, uh, thank some people before I go any further. I'd like to, uh, today, uh, the entire uh, day for me was spent uh, on a virtual visit to the Ohio State University campus. And I met some really wonderful people. Uh, uh, the president, Christina Johnson and I got in the words of Michael, we got mathy in our discussion this morning, talking about some things that will come out tonight. The Dean of the College of Arts and Science, Gretchen Ritter, uh, the Dean of uh, Natural uh, and Mathematical Science, Susan Olisik, and of course, Michael Boyer himself. And I also got a chance to interact with uh, Terry Bradley and Brian Dunlap, and finally, Ruth uh, Leonard. But that finally just means that she was just a super person to make this all happen. So I'm very grateful to all of you for making this such a hospitable Zoom visit to Ohio State. I'd like to get started my presentation now, because uh, we're gonna do, we're gonna, first we're gonna learn some physics, and then we're gonna go beyond the learned physics and begin to talk about the research that I do, because I, I always sort of work just beyond the boundary, and that's where we're going today. So uh, let's see if I can get my image up for everyone. And it seems like it's coming pretty soon. One, one always gets nervous uh, in these technological tra uh, transitions and make sure everything's going to happen. Uh, and so we've uh, got, I, mean, I got to back this thing up. I am so sorry. I didn't, there we go. So, how thinking like a geneticist helped me solve a 25 year old Einstein type problem in string theory. That's where we're going today. First of all, we're gonna learn some physics. So let's get on with the learning. Um, first, we're gonna go from chemistry to the standard model and spin. Uh, when uh, Mendeleev first uh, uh, created the table of elements, it looked as you see on the screen now. And if you look very carefully, you see there are holes and he used those holes to predict the existence of elements that had not been discovered in nature. And if we look at it today, it's nice and symmetrical. All the holes are filled in and there are a lot more elements. So that shows you that science is dynamical. It's always changing. Now, if we come to our era of physics, uh, people are concerned with not so much atoms, but smaller parts of atoms called elementary particles. And this is a standard table that's part of an image that's distributed often in physics departments by the Department of Energy. In this image, you can see a bunch of letters, uh, the letter nu, e, mu, and tau, uh, those are leptons. You also see the letters U, D, C, S, T, and B. Those are quarks. And then to the right of those, you see the Greek symbol gamma for the photon, W plus, W minus, and Z zero. Those are the uh, carriers of the weak nu nuclear force. And this letter G on the side in green, gluons, there are eight of them and they carry the strong nuclear force or the quantum chromodynamic force. In 2012, we discovered one more of these small, tiny particles, the Higgs boson, which had been searched for for almost 40 years. Now, it turns out all of these objects act like little spinning balls. They spin on their axis, 
and they have a rate of spin whose square we call, we denote by S square, and is determined by an integer, uh, integer or half integer J. And so the formula re that relates the rate to the letter J is on your formula, is on the screen. And this quantity H bar is a constant of nature, much like the speed of light is a constant of nature. And yes, these little objects spin. So here we can see them, at least in our mind's eye and imagination spinning. I'm gonna call J the jiggle parameter. And in a, later in the talk, we'll find out why that's the case. Now, if we take spin into account, we can move the location of the uh, quarks and leptons lower than the location of the, uh, of the gluons, the, gamma, the photon, the Z, the Ws, and the Higgs boson. Uh, and we take them, uh, we do this because spin distinguishes them. So, uh, but we also do this because the matter particles that you see in this table, that means this is stuff that the forces act upon. The energy part of the table are the things that cause the force to be transmitted from one location to another. So that's my quick lesson telling you about the standard model. I hope that was pretty painless. We're gonna keep pushing on. So this is, uh, I like to call this guy the secular pope of physics, Albert Einstein. This is one of my favorite images of him. It comes from the 1999 cover of Time magazine. He was, the, he was voted the man of the century. And what did he do? Well, he taught us that space and time can be bent into each other. Now it takes a little bit of math to get to the, uh, the details of it. And you see that at the bottom, but I, I, I I beg your indulgence because there's not going to be too much of this math stuff to confuse us all. So what did he do? Well, we can see this animation. animation. He suggested that space and time can be bent. That is, the length of objects can shrink or contract, and the duration can be longer or shorter than we thought. There is one constant in this image. If you look at the slope angle of the yellow lines, no matter what happens, it's always the same. That represents the constancy of the speed of light. He also, that was his 1905 work. But in 1915, he did something even more remarkable. He developed the theory of general relativity. This theory is what tells us that space-time acts like a grid. It's not actually a grid, but the mathematics is the same. And this grid gets indentations whenever you put something very massive on it. So in this image, you can see the sun and then the indentation on the space-time grid under it. We're gonna now set this into motion. You'll notice the Earth creates its own little indentation, and that indentation is what keeps the moon orbiting around the Earth, just like the indentation of the sun keeps the Earth orbiting around the sun. So that's the basic essence of Einstein's theory of general relativity. But at this point, we're getting into some extraordinarily deep mathematics that involves a differential geometry. But again, we're not going to dig down too deep for that stuff. Now you see Einstein's image over to the left-hand side of this, uh, this slide. And that image is taken from the statue of Einstein at the National Academy of Sciences. Um, Einstein, although he never made his peace with it, played a role in the birth of quantum mechanics among his 1905 year of miracles, it's called. He wrote one paper uh, on uh, the photoelectric effect. And that paper showed that photons carry energy in clumps, in quanta. And so he actually was uh, made a very important contribution there. Now, before Einstein, we thought of physics as what Newton gave us. That's, and in this image here, what I'm showing is the classical path. That is, if you threw a ball, uh, if a ball is moving according to Newton and there are no forces uh, acting on it, it moves in a straight line. But if uh, you consider a quantum mechanical version of that ball, it doesn't necessarily have to move in a straight line. It might move in a straight line, and there's a certain probability for that but it might also move in this jagged path that you see illustrated on this image. At the bottom, I noted a result that the path, the probability of the path, and that's what we mean by P of P, is proportional to an expression involving the exponential function and the action. This was most carefully uh, defined and used as a calculation tool by the physicist Richard Feynman. So what does this all mean for us? Well, again, let's look at some images. If we follow uh, the way that the two electrons are illustrated in this drawing by the white dots that you see at the bottom part of the, of the image, uh, why do electrons repel each other? Well, they are both negatively charged, like charges repel. But in the quantum mechanical, I'm sorry, but in the viewpoint of 
Feynman and his Feynman diagrams, which is what this is, what actually happens is the particles move along, one particle sends a photon from one position to the other, and that's what tells the second particle to be repulsed. And so that's that classical picture of electromagnetic repulsion using a Feynman diagram. So that corresponds to the for a particle moving in a straight line. However, we also have the quantum view. So the quantum view for a particle was it can move in a jiggly, wiggly manner from one place to another. And you, all you can talk about is the probability of a path. So what does that apply to the forces? Well, here's a diagram, which uh, was very similar to our other diagram. At the bottom, we see these two light dots representing electrons. We're gonna let them move along. However, the uh, electron to the left is going to emit a particle of light, of light which travels from from one location to a, a second location where this first electron will reabsorb it. It will also uh, emit a second particle of light, which is the message carrier to the second electron that you should be repulsed. So here we go. Now in this process, which uh, we can show again, the, uh, I'm sorry, the quantum nature of the interaction is the fact that there was a second photon emitted and reabsorbed. Now, that first diagram where there was just only one photon, that leads us to the one over square repulsion. This leads to a different repulsion law, not the uh, one over square that we learned in high school. But in quantum mechanics, this is only one of the possibilities. Here's another. The first one we saw was called vertex uh, renormalization. This one is called the vacuum polarization diagram. And in this diagram, we're gonna see our first electron emits a particle of light, which then disappears, turning into an electron positron pair. The positron is the antiparticle to the electron. It has the opposite charge. So they attract each other, they get back together and create a second photon, which is the, the actual message carrier. So here we go. So now we're starting to take quantum mechanics into effect. And again, this contributes a slightly different contribution to the repulsive force. Now, these are not the only two diagrams. In fact, there are an infinite number of diagrams and the more complicated uh, you draw the diagram, the less the probability of the events occurred, but they all have to be taken into account. And how do we know this actually works? Well, because we actually measure these sorts of things, you see, that classical nice simple diagram where only one photon was emitted, if you uh, use that uh, calculation to calculate a magnetic property of the electron, it gives you the number two. So the two that you see on, at the leading of these parts of this, one, the theoretical value comes from uh, calculating Feynman di diagrams. Now, the measured value is an actual experiment that, had, that run, has been running for decades. Now, when you start to add in the extra diagrams, that's where you find these other bits of numbers coming from though. More accurate you want these numbers, the more diagrams you have to throw in. And so this is how we know that quantum mechanics is accurate. It's better, it is the only piece of science humanity has, that has, has ever created where we can predict a number to greater than one part in a billion, go and measure that number by doing an experiment. And the two of them agreed, as I said, to one part in a billion. I know of no other piece of science for which you can say that. So that's quantum mechanics and the uh, force of the uh, force of electromagnetism, the weak nuclear force and the strong nuclear force. But that view of gravity doesn't really work. I'm sorry, that view of the quantum mechanics doesn't work for gravity. So let's get into gravity a bit. Oh, let's see here. Um, I bet you recognize the gentleman who's sitting in the chair at the front of the picture. Yes, that's Stephen Hawking in 1980. There's one guy in this picture who has a really good tan and a lot of long black hair. Yep, that's your speaker. That's me in 1980. That uh, was the first time I, I met Steve and, and our paths crossed a number of times in our life. This was a meeting that took place at Cambridge University called the Nuffield Conference. And I was one of the people working on something called supergravity. And Stephen was interested in learning in supergravity. So he got the, essentially the world's, uh, essentially almost all the researchers in the world who were working on the subject. And this is our conference photo. Uh, when Stephen died a few years ago, uh, the BBC asked me to comment about uh, my perspective on some of his contributions. 
and in particular on black holes. So let's see, um, I hope the, uh, the audio works. So here we go, let's see. Playing one of Hawking's theories in under a minute. Uh, Stephen was one of the people who was sort of like Moses in the sense that a result he found, which was that black holes are not completely black. They actually have a kind of sizzle about them. This is called Bekenstein Hawking radiation now. And in his research, he's a person who explained how this could happen. And it turned out that if you use Einstein's equations in quantum mechanics, they don't agree with what Stephen's intuition was. That set the foundation to create string theory. So this strange thing called string theory, which you may have heard about from Brian Greene, actually has uh, to resolve this puzzle about why you cannot combine cl uh, quantum mechanics with general relativity. Now, at the elementary particle level, uh, I've shown you this diagram before. This is uh, all the elementary particles when we take spin into account. Now, look at that picture for a moment, that image. It doesn't look pretty to me. It doesn't look pretty to me because it's not a balanced picture. As you can see, it's very highly asymmetrical. So remember how in the table of elements, we first start off with some holes in uh, Mendeleev's ta table, and then we wait a couple of decades and uh, maybe a century or more, and then all the holes have disappeared because we discovered new elements. Well, suppose it were the case that as we continue to advance technological, we find more elementary particles. So much so that this table becomes symmetrical. Now, we humans actually like symmetry. It seems to be encoded into our, our, our uh, DNA almost. And so there's an expectation for some of us that as we continue to do particle physics, this kind of filling in will occur. And you'll notice this, paper, this image has a right-left symmetry attached to it. This right-left symmetry that you can see visually here is a manifestation of a mathematical property called supersymmetry. And as Michael mentioned in my introduction, I've been studying this since I, was, I got my PhD at MIT in 1977, having written MIT's first thesis on this subject. Now, supersymmetry is a theoretical idea. It is not something that we have observed in the laboratory. Over the course of the last a decade and a half, people have been looking for it and in 2006, before the Large Hadron Collider was turned on, uh, I was invited to give a perspective on this subject, a string theory, and it, uh, which is based on supersymmetry. And so I wrote this article called, Is String Theory Phenomenologically Viable? And in the article, I point out that some cherished ideas might just fail to pass the test. And in fact, the discovery of these extra particles, which most of the particle physics community thought was just around the corner, was the thing that I found least likely. In fact, my claim was that it was much more likely that evidence for supersymmetry would not emerge from something as powerful as the LHC, but by doing high precision measurements. High precision, where have we heard that before? Well, gee, that was that the whole discussion around the magnetic property of electrons. So, I would tell people that if you want to look for supersymmetry, you should be looking for deviations in these very, very extraordinarily precise measurements like the, electro, like the electric magnetic dipole moment, electric uh, magnetic uh, moment. There are other things called coupling constants and there are decay rates, branching ratios. That's where I expect supersymmetry to first show up. And when just before the LHC turned on, there was no evidence of such devi deviations, which is why I was confident to say it was unlikely that the LHC would find super partners. Now I've got to take you through some math. I told you I'd keep, I'd try to keep it out as much as possible. But now we're getting into it where we got it. We have to go there. So the Higgs boson, that was the last elementary particle that joined our table, uh, can be thought of in, uh, by an analogy by using the, uh, a slinky. Uh, the Higgs boson has basically has two parts. There's one part called the vacuum value. And if you look at this picture of the slinky, you'll notice that there are clumps in it, but there are regions without clumps. The regions without clumps are like the vacuum value of the Higgs boson. Let me start it again. Uh, and so uh, then you see the reason with the clumps in the slinky those clumps are the, like the Higgs boson that we've detected 
at the LHC. And as you can see, uh, this, uh, this uh, illustration comes from YouTube. YouTube has lots of very interesting scientific diagrams. And since there's only one kind of way this thing can move, uh, we say it has a degree of freedom which is equal to one. You can use a little bit of mathematics to describe all of this. In fact, it turns out that the equations that describe the motion of the Higgs boson are basically the same equations that describe sound waves. And so here's a description of a sound wave for people who use calculus and stuff like that, which is after all, that's what we physicists do. I often joke with people that physicists, we should change our name. Instead of calling physicists, we should all say, we're a member of a company called uh, Equations Are Us. Because what we do is use equations to predict and understand the behavior of nature. Now, Einstein and Maxwell are also two, uh, Maxwell in particular, uh, is one of the three greatest physicists uh, in history. Newton starts physics. Uh, Maxwell follows him. And what Maxwell does is describe electric electricity and magnets. And his mathematics is uh, more sophisticated. It's based on calculus but it's of an upgraded version over the calculus invention of, of Newton. And so I've shown you some mathematical symbols here. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about them, but this is some of the basic things that uh, Maxwell did. However, I've written it according to what, what the insight of Einstein's theory of special relativity. The E and B that you see in, uh, on this image represent the electric field for E and the magnetic field for B. Einstein teaches us how, that space and time are related to one another. You can see that down in the left-hand corner. I have an X with an arrow that represents space. And then I have the speed of light times time that represents time. And so Einstein tells us in some sense, these things should be clumped together as should their derivatives, which you can see in the second object. And for electromagnetism, it turns out that the voltage difference and the magnetic uh, potential are clumped together also. And so this is, Maxwell theory, according to Einstein. Uh, there are some more deep mathematics, things called covariant derivatives. And again, you don't need to sort of uh, dwell on these except to know that these things exist. Because these things were the inspiration that Einstein used to get to his great 1915 accomplishment. Now, before we go there, let's look at some of the predictions of these equations. So in this image, I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to excite a light particle from the origin, which is behind this circular disk, which is a, a representation of what's called a quarter wave, wave plate. And when I excite the light particle, we're gonna see a wave go up and down until it gets to the quarter wave plate. And then we're gonna use a wave plate to separate it. So here we go. You can see it separates into two different things. There's a right winder, which is on the top part, and a left winding motion on the lower part. So the top we say is a right circularly polarized light ray, and the bottom we describe as a left circularly polarized light ray. So there were two of them. And so that for that reason, what we do is say that light has degrees of freedom two, not one like the Higgs boson. Now, that polarization turns out to have apparently been known to the Vikings. If you read uh, some of the literature about Vikings, they had these mysterious crystals that would allow them to accurately take the position of the sun, even when it was cloudy outside, where you couldn't actually see the sun. And it seems to be the case that these crystals, and I have an image of one of them here, uh, allowed the Vikings to see the polarization of the light. If you could see the polarization, you could see where it was coming from, and therefore you didn't directly need to see the sun in order to use the sun to navigate. And so polarization seems to have been, and, and uh, using these crystals, seems to have been the most likely way why Vikings were able to navigate even when the sun wasn't out. Now, this polarization on the left, you'll see this funny sort of uh, two dumbbell figures, one blue and one yellow. Uh, this was actually noted by uh, an Austrian uh, geologist named Heidinger. And this image is called Heidinger's brush because the, the, uh, he saw it by looking at quartz. And what the quartz does is allow you to detect the separation into those two polarization states. And some humans, it turns out, can actually detect polarization without the quartz at all. It's 
They're just very special and lucky. And you can actually use uh, polarized glasses and look at a computer screen and see this effect also. So those degrees of freedom are there. They you clear up a historical mystery, but they come directly from the mathematics. And here's the mathematics for describing those waves. So now we're gonna move on to Einstein. His math is deeper. Uh, the most important thing is at the bottom of this image. This is his version of Maxwell's equations. And this is a thing that tells us the universe was created in a big bang. You see, the big bang is actually a mathematical property of these equations. And it wasn't actually invented by Einstein at all. And in fact, it was a, uh, it was a Augustan monk by the name of Lamathra who first suggested that our universe uh, was started in a big bang. And at first Einstein was very skeptical but uh, Lamarck was a very good mathematician, maybe better than Einstein. And he figured it out and he was right. And eventually Einstein agreed with him. And here's one of the solutions. So what does that look like? Remember for light, I was able to take you from mathematics to seeing waves that either wound left or wound to the right. Uh, nowadays we have an experiment called LIGO. LIGO detects gravitational waves. So let's go and act like we're at LIGO and ask ourselves what's being detected. Again, there's a wonderful resource at YouTube. I've got the link in here. And if you go to the source, what you can find is an image that looks like this. So this image, we're gonna set into dynamical motion. This is what happens when a gravity wave comes from the back of this uh, image and imagine that it's coming towards you. If there were a set of circles that you would look through, you would see the de deformation of the circles where they go from being circular to being elliptical spread out along the right left axis to being elliptical spread out along the up down axis. And it's this spreading out of the arms of LIGO that the experiment detects and that's how we know gravitational waves are passing through. What about polarization? Well, LIGO is not built to detect polarization. So it's not, it, uh, we don't have the uh, equivalent of the uh, Vikings uh, uh, crystals to look at it. But in the future, when we get greater technology, we will, we should be able to detect uh, the uh, polarization of gravity. And when we do, it'll look something like this. Wow, look at that. There's that rightward twisting motion. So it's just like the right-handed polarization of light waves, except it's a more complicated jiggle. And notice J is equal to two for the graviton. J was equal to one for the photon. The graviton spins at a, uh, has a spin rate of two, not a spin rate of one. And that's why you get this different kind of shape. So this is a right circularly polarized. What about a left circularly polarized gravitational wave? Well, here we go. So at some point in the future, there's gonna be an advanced LIGO that will likely go and try to detect the polarization of light rays, of gravitational waves, just like we know about the polarization of light waves. There's one other thing that's even beyond the capacity of LIGO, but that people are starting to uh, talk about. I don't know if there are any science fiction fans out there, but I'm a science fiction fan. And if you're a science fiction fan of Star Trek and the Star Trek universe, they often talk about graviton beams. Now, graviton is not just a gravity wave. It's a gravity wave where the energy is carried in packets, in quanta, just like energy and light is carried in quanta. So at some point in the future, we're going to, as a species, build devices that actually measure the energy carrying capacity of these, of these gravitational waves. And according to the mathematical theory, we should find that this energy comes in packets. And so that's gonna be really exciting. To me, that's the next great frontier in understanding the physics of gravity waves. So what's the Einstein problem that I, that I claimed that I was going to show you? Well, we're now ready to delve in. Uh, the challenge which string theory meets uh, is to combine quantum theory on, in, indicated by this left-handed image and general relativity. We want them to sit comfortably and be able to make predictions that we can check. Uh, our current, without something beyond general relativity, we cannot do this. And, brought, and the work of Stephen Hawking is one of the two things that says we have to be able to do this because black holes require both of these kinds of mathematical descriptions of nature. 
Now, there are some people who believe that there are alternatives to string theory, but many of us who study this question would look uh, askance at such assertions. The evidence is much more strong that string theory is likely the path in which this combination will be accomplished successfully. So it turns out the string theory uh, was because just like constructing the Mendeleev table, at any point in time, we physicists are busy putting things together, but we may not have the whole story. And so in the middle 90s, we, we thought, gee, there are five different strings. And you can see them listed to the left-hand side in this graph. There's type one, SO32 heterotic, the E8 uh, plus E8 heterotic, and the type 2A and the type 2B. But in 1995, Edward Witten proposed something amazing. He said, you know, these five theories that you think are different are actually five different manifestations of a single kind of theory. And this theory was called M theory. Now, M theory is the overall uh, umbrella of all the string theories that we know, but it also includes something called 11 dimensional supergravity, which itself is not a string theory, but that was the other piece of evidence that Edward used. So here, what is this 11 dimensional supergravity? Well, let's look at this table. In this table, you'll see a bunch of symbols. And these symbols, just like in my previous part of the discussion, remember uh, where we were seeing, uh, for example, the electron was uh, indicated by the symbol E for electron. Uh, the uh, quarks were illust illustrated by the letters E, uh, I'm sorry, by the letters U for up and D for down. So here, you know, what the idea is, let's look at the mathematics of a universe where there are 10 spatial directions and one temporal dimension. And this quantity that you see H in this diagram, that's a representation of gravity in that mathematical universe. Now, in our universe, in addition to gravity, we have things like electrons. Now, the electron doesn't carry forces. The, elect the graviton does. But in this 11-dimensional theory, its mathematical consistency says that you have an object that is similar to an electron, and that's why you have fermion, but it's a force carrier. And so on the left-hand side of this image, I have this thing psi mu alpha. It's got the properties of the electron, but it also has properties of being a force carrier. On the right-hand side of this image, the H is, uh, is a representation of a gravitational-like force, but the A is more like an electromagnetic type force in, in some general sense. So this is the supergravity or sugra limit of M theory. And this was first proposed by Edward Witten in 1995. So what's, what's the problem? So you'll recall that when I got to supersymmetry, uh, when we looked at the elementary particles, I had to balance left and right. Well, in order for supersymmetry to exist, which is required for the mathematical consistency of M theory and string theory, the left and right matching still has to occur. So if we look at this electron-like object and we look only uh, on its degrees of freedom on the classical path, the number is 128. When we look at the degrees of freedom of this electron, of this graviton-like object and this photon-like object in the low dimension, their degrees of freedom are equal to 44, as we can see, and 84. Now, um, if you do the, if you say, well, let me not worry about whether they're on their classical paths, but if they're on some other arbitrary path, then in fact, you see different numbers. We get uh, one number 320 for the uh, so-called gravitino, and we get 66 and 165 for these two particles on the right. And you don't have to be Einstein to figure out <laughs> that um, those two numbers don't match. Now, in order to keep track of all these Greek symbols, you see the psi has a, a Greek symbol mu and alpha, the H has a mu nu, the A has a mu nu and a rho. What we can do is replace those by boxes. Now, this is something that mathematicians have taught us to do. These boxes are called young tableaus. And instead of writing indices, we can just write a box, one, a, one, uh, a box, a red box and a blue box for the graviton, uh, two boxes for the, uh, that are uh, horizontal for the, uh, gra for the graviton, I'm sorry, the side for the gravitino, one red, one blue. For the graviton, 
two blue boxes horizontally related, and for this photon-like object, three boxes that are vertically related. Uh, now, the counting was wrong, but this sort of problem was actually seen in four dimensions uh, years ago in 1973. And so, the theory of supergravity in four dimensions was known by 76. And if you look at this right left symmetry, that's true if you count these objects moving along the classical path, but not if they're moving quantum mechanically. And the fix that people learned was you add more things to it. So in 1977, a physicist named Brighton Owner said, I'm going to add 14 different functions that are like the electron and I'm going to add a sufficient number uh, uh, for the uh, graviton so that I get 20. And now you have the left, right left balance and now supersymmetry is restored. And you can be confident that you have a chance at writing a, uh, a, co a complete uh, theory of, of um, that's consistent with quantum mechanics. So that's the solution. The second solution was found in 78, which even uses less. And so can we do this for this M theory that Witten tells us it controls all the string theory? That's the question that I want to solve. Well, in order to solve this problem, which has, by the way, been known since shortly, since certainly by 2000, no one's ever had ever solved it. And from time to time, I had been thinking about it. And so I'm going to take you to a little discur a discursive journey through time, back to a physicist named Max Delbruck. Max Delbruck uh, in the 1930s decided to use physics constructions to make advances in biology and genetics. So I'm gonna follow his lead here. Uh, here's a picture of uh, Max. He was re awarded uh, the uh, Nobel Prize in 1969, but not for biology because although he did a lot of his work in biology, um, uh, uh, the award was actually for his work in physics. And what work was that? Well, you remember those Feynman diagrams I showed you that we had little balls of light bouncing off each other because they were exchanging photons? Well, you can also have other diagrams. And in, in particular, the right-hand diagram, diagram here shows that light can scatter against light if the universe is quantum mechanical. And this was actually measured. And so that was part of the reason why Delbrook uh, was able to uh, ultimately get, uh, uh, to get the Nobel Prize. The left-hand diagram is something that was measured uh, just before he was awarded the Nobel Prize. Because the Nobel Prize, let's make sure you folks understand how the Nobel works. You have to make a prediction and that uh, is if you're a theorist, but that prediction has got to be observed in the laboratory. Predictions without observational support don't get Nobel Prizes. Um, Chemistry. Well, when Delbrook started thinking about biology and genetics, it was a, near the birth of quantum mechanics and physicists had actually also been thinking about inheritability and genetics. And in particular, genetic traits were known to be transmitted from parent to child, but no one actually knew what physical structure carried that information. And so there were some physicists who thought maybe crystal, they're a type of crystal that could carry the genetic information uh, from parent to child. This is, I've just picked here an, an arbitrary mineral. It has a crystalline structure. The mineral is called phagocyte. And it has this mineral structure uh, that you can see here. However, a very young uh, 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 X-ray crystallographer by the name of Rosalind Franklin killed that idea because she was able to show that the basic mechanism by which genetics occurs is through the genome with uh, deoxyribonucleic acid or DNA. She was the person who actually first got the clearest pictures of DNA. And that led to uh, understanding that the DNA, uh, this is work obviously done by Watson and Crick, that the DNA is a double helix structure where the base pairs that are the links in the double helix are adenine and thymine and guanine and cytosine and that the backbones are sugar phosphates. So this is what her work did and it laid the foundation for Watson and Crick 
uh, and their discovery of the um, double helix. Uh, you can read about this stuff. Uh, this is a nice book called, by Gareth Williams uh, called The Unraveling of the Double Helix, The Lost Heroes, and you'll learn about Rosalind and lots of other people in there. Uh, at the uh, round 2000, we were able to use this information to create essentially maps, what we call maps of life, uh, the Human Genome Project, where we now know what these structures that I showed you, we know with precision what they look like inside of humanity. And this has led to a burgeoning field of bioinformatics. So bioinformatics is the merger of biology and genetics and the information that's carried at the genomic level. And this particular book, uh, in Informatics for Evolutionary Biologists, is something that leads into work that a colleague of mine at the National uh, Academy of Sciences carries out, Dr. Rich Linsky, who's actually on this uh, webcast. And I want to talk about uh, Rick's work, Richard's work for a little bit, because I find it extraordinarily beautiful. Um, he's actually used uh, genetic markers and what have you to replay evolution. Now, obviously, we don't have time machines. And so one of the questions about evolution is if you start from a given point, do you always wind up at the same endpoint. And so Rick's work uh, actually has been looking at this by uh, uh, looking at uh, not, uh, not large complicated structures like people, but by looking at uh, smaller biological units. And what they have found is in particular, if you uh, look at, um, uh, my goodness, I'm, I'm demonstrating I'm, I'm not a, a, bio, a geneticist, but if you look at uh, E. coli, and its ability to uh, synthesize uh, chemicals for energy, uh, they all, the standard one, the standard uh, mechanism in involves glucose. And so what Rick is able, Richard and his lab have been able to do is they run this experiment over and over again. Uh, at point A is basically, you can think about taking uh, different cell lines of E. coli, putting them in an environment and then letting them evolve uh, because they, their life cycles are very, very much accelerated with regard to time. So in order to get 20,000 uh, generations of evolution, you don't have to wait 20,000 years, you wait just a few years. And what he was able to show together with his colleagues is that almost always the evolution leads to the efficient, um, the efficient uh, meta uh, metabolic processes using glucose, but every now and then, uh, you can get a mutation that actually finds a different route, and in particular, uh, uh, citrates uh, as an alternative, and uh, those are also survivable, and only one uh, lineage uh, of this experiment was able to do this. It's a very beautiful set of experiments, and so I take uh, great inspiration that we can replay evolution by looking at uh, how uh, microbes evolve uh, that have much faster life cycles. So with this inspiration, I was like, well, this problem in physics that I can't solve and no one else, maybe biology and genetics have some, something to teach us. Um, the final part about uh, biological data is that there are these systems called basic local alignment search tools. And these basic, alomo, uh, uh, basic local alignment search tools are basically huge libraries. They're libraries that allow you to take segments of genetic material and fit them into larger collections and so this is a website. You can see NIH supports this. And if you actually want to take a run at it, you've got some data, uh, you go to this front end, you enter the data, and you can find out what your segments are parts of larger genetic structures. And so this use of blast type technology is what kind of, and that was in the back of my mind, allowed me to make some advances on my physics problem. So how does it work? Well, we're going to take Delbrook's ideas but instead of exporting physics into biology, we're gonna do the reverse. We're gonna import biology into physics. Um, this started uh, in 2019 here at Brown University, working with two of my graduate students, Jan Gray Hugh and Hazel Mock. We started writing papers that would allow us to set up a blast type technology in our realm. So we had one paper in November, 2019, there was a subsequent paper in February of 2020, and finally a third paper in June of 2020. And the result of these papers is that we know how to set up blast type libraries studying the structures that are associated with M theory. 
now there's a, another part to this, which goes back to 2004, where basically we learn to sequence equations. That's a kind of a strange idea that you could sequence equations, but you can. Uh, this started with a piece of work that I did with a physicist named Michael Fox. And what we, you can see this image, the yellow dot sort of represents M theory. You should think of it as a sun. The point at the apex of this pyramid is to represent 11 dimensional supergravity. And the point at the apex of the triangle on the flat surface is what you would see if you could project it. And our sequencing process is a kind of projection. So how does it work? Well, first of all, uh, when we stumbled upon this, like uh, most physicists, when you find something that you think is really cool and new, you give it a name. And so we decided to name these projections, these sequenced projection pieces of mathematics, adinkras. The word adinkra comes uh, from West Africa where it stands for a set of symbols with hidden meanings. In fact, this was the cover of Physics World Magazine in 2010. And this brown shaped object that you see here is an actual traditional adinkra from West Africa. So our projection works by taking advantage of Einstein. Einstein tells us that our universe uh, looks like uh, two cones that where we sit at the apex, the future is one cone that opens up in front of us, the past, that can affect us is a cone that has its apex at our location. So we applied this idea to the equations that come out of this super symmetric balance. And here's some equations. Again, don't be afraid of them. We're not gonna spend very much time, but I wanna show you that I can sequence equations. So we start with these sets of equations. We use this Einstein cone type of idea. And for the top image, this is its sequenced version. Now you'll say that's not quite a sequence and you're right, it's a network. But networks are very, very useful to know. And so we discovered this technology that turns equations into networks. If I go and if I have a network, it turns out that I can deform it, as you can see here. And what that does is actually make the mathematics simpler. And so we use these simplified versions to study the equations that are much more complicated. Again, let me do this to get, uh, this process. We went from the, uh, we went from the network associated with the actual equations in four dimensions to a network in one dimension that we claim carries a lot of the information, a sufficient amount of the information for the four dimensional. Let me do the same thing for the photon, which is this thing A. So here's its equations of four dimensions. I run it through my Einstein sequencer. I get this network. Once again, this network can be deformed because it's a simple mathematical object. And then once you put it in this final form, it turns out that you are now able to compare these things in four dimensions and you find out that they, so here's the sequencing actually done. You can see it turns into numbers, uh, four sets of uh, integers. For that first object, when I sequence it completely, I find a set of four, uh, a set of four integers. For that second object, I find a set, a set of four integers. And you'll notice that none of these sets of fours are the same as the sets of fours on the top. And so this is like genetic sequencing of different uh, biological and genetic structures. Uh, there's one other set of equations that I'm not showing you because they're connected to supergravity and string theory. But when you sequence them, you find out you get yet another set of fours. And then at this point, studying with my mathematical colleagues, what is the rules for building these networks we found out that mathematically, we can actually even construct things that didn't come from four dimensions. And that all of these objects fit into a very beautiful structure called the permutahedron that mathematicians who study perm permutation groups actually use as a way to, to study the mathematical uh, properties of such objects. It's a beautiful piece of, mat of, of uh, mathematics. And I, since I've been here at Brown, I've been talking with one of my colleagues uh, in the math department, uh, trying to pursue uh, even deeper understanding of these structures. But for our purposes, we now are in position to construct these blast-like networks. We have these network structures of these things called the dinkras. The boxes I showed you are called Dinkin labels. We put boxes at the nodes, not just the dots. There's a powerful mathematical formalism for how to multiply these boxes. It's called clefism. And then finally, we just need raw computational power. And so taking these four steps and using each one, we have been able to sequence completely 
the sets of equations that have the left-right balance and are relevant for M theory. There are 4,147,483,648 bosons in this sequencing and the same number of fermions. And this is what the object looks like. Now, obviously, I'm not going to write some four billion dots on a sheet of paper because it would just be a blizzard. So what I've done is I've just shown the lowest, um, the lowest five levels. The open ball, the open dots are the bosons, the closed dots are the fermions. And using uh, computer programs, modern computer programs, we have essentially have built this genome for, it's a mathematical object, but it's basically a genome for other mathematical equations. This object in totality is rather diamond shaped. And that's why I have the diamond on the side of this image. The top, the bottom that you can see here is a single dot that rep is represented by the bottom apex of this diamond. If you work your way all the way through the uh, dot, dot, dots to the rest of the very top of this, you'd find out that there's a mirror image dot at the top of it. So this thing in general, even though it has, it's uh, 4 billion parts, is diamond shaped. Uh, it's middle, it's 32 levels. Its middle has 296 separate fields. Um, and what we've done in this table is list the number of fields as you go up in level. And remember, this is all constructed with mathematics based on the structure of these networks. And so we now know that if you start with M theory with the fields that Ed Witten uh, used to construct it, that in fact, there are lots and lots of other fields. In fact, you need uh, over a thousand other fields to have something that's consistent with this left-right balance. And if you start with the fermions, again, you need over a thousand fields in order to get this left-right balance. Uh, what about the jiggle parameter? Because that's a, uh, an important one. Well, it turns out the data in the jiggle parameter, which we re represented by boxes, we can also now computationally figure out the sequencing of them. And so that lowest uh, box that you see has, uh, takes uh, five uh, integers, which are all zero, the first level was a four zeros and a one and so forth until you work your way all the way through this object. Let's go up to the 16th level. So here it is. Wow, it's a mess. Now, how did our blast-like analogy work? Well, let's see. There's a 65. If you look back at the image that I wrote for the Graviton, it was a 66. So 65 plus one is 66. So we can see an embedding of the graviton into this large genomic-like structure of mathematics. That thing with three vector indices, which was three boxes, was a 165. And sure enough, there's a 165 here. So this library that we constructed is like a BLAST, a basic local alignment tool that geneticists use. And now we have used it to solve a question that had gone unresolved since the invention of M theory. So why is this all important? Well, I'm not really a mathematician. I just pretend to be one. I, I like to describe myself as a fallen mathematician. But why is this uh, of interest? Well, uh, last summer, a year ago, uh, I and some of my other collaborators were looking at the issue of whether string theory might leave imprints on the cosmic microwave background. There were some very beautiful ideas that were floating about. Uh, this is one of the uh, papers. And what we were able to show in our work is that M theory, since it has to actually have these higher spin analogs, uh, leads to a set of states, which I have represented here by this triangular figure. These are exactly like the states that show up in a hydrogen atom. And so it's really beautiful, I believe, that if we look at the cosmic microwave background with enough, uh, enough uh, precision, we may be able to detect the presence of these structures. And if we detect them, it will mean that something like SUGRA, which consistent with quantum mechanics means M theory, will have actually made a signal, not in a collider, but in the cosmic microwave background. And that's the consistency stuff. That's why we're really interested in these questions. So this brings me to the end of my recitation.
Uh, we started uh, around uh, eight. Uh, I've been speaking just about 50 minutes. We started around 8.10. Uh, I have a long list of collaborators to thank, including uh, some colleagues like Al Stefan Alexander, uh, my students, uh, my other colleagues, Tristan Hughes, uh, William Lynch, and um, uh, let's see, Michael Fox. Uh, these are all faculty colleagues. And then the rest of these uh, are young people that I've worked with uh, over since uh, 2005 to try to understand how these kinds of genetic structures, mathematical genetic structures are relevant. And the research was supported by the National Science Foundation, the uh, Brown University Ford uh, Endowment, and also by the Center for String and Particle Theory at uh, Maryland. Uh, the, a, a number of the graphical, computer graphical images that I use in this presentation are drawn from a work that uh, is uh, a commercial product called uh, String Theory, the DNA of Reality. It uh, cre was created in 2005. The computer animation was actually done by uh, Mr. Kenneth Griggs. And so that's why I'm able to show you these Feynman diagrams because even in 205, I was thinking about having a library of images that would allow me to talk to people who are not physicists about the crazy and beautiful ideas that go on inside of a physicist's head as they wrestle with problems at the boundary. So with this, I am done. Awesome. Well, thank you, Jim. That was, that was wonderful. Um, I, I normally everyone would be uh, cheering now, uh, but they can't directly. <laughs> well, so well, I, well I'll, I'll imagine that uh, some yeah. of our participants can put in chat uh, comments of what they thought about what just happened to them. Well, we do. We have a lot of questions coming in.